let me introduce our special guest, our speaker tonight, Dr. John Haskin. He is a friend of groups like ours who believe in liberty, limited government, and the First Amendment rights. He is a board-certified medical doctor, specializing in pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, internal medicine, and sleep medicine. He is affiliated with four hospitals, including Mercy Hospital, Winthrop University Hospital, North Shore University Hospital, Manhasset, and North Shore University Hospital, Franklin Square. He has been providing med medical care to the communities of Long Island for the last 15 years, and now he has taken on a new role of public service to the communities. He generously gives of his time to educate the public on the critical details of Obamacare and courageously exposes the, the um, I'm sorry, the devastating effects on our health care system. And with that, let me introduce and please welcome Dr. If no one can hear me or if you can't hear me well enough, please just let me know. Um, I feel like though I do want to add something to the CV that I didn't think of before as I'm listening to the whole things. I'm a member of Knights of Columbus, St. Mary's Council, fourth uh, degree. I remember the South Military Temple of Jerusalem. It was a really long time for a little boy. And uh, the president of the SAL for the Melbourne Post. Um, and a reminder as a prayer, and I please, please, please remember this, guys. This Friday is George Washington's Day of Fasting and Prayer. So if you can, make that ablation. Um, it's worth it. Uh, I think so. Because we're going to need his help, that's for darn sure. Well, a lot of things on Obamacare, which, uh, since he doesn't mind to call that, I don't either, uh, which we'll talk about. Well, it went before the Supreme Court. You all know that. Uh, it was declared constitutional, according to Supreme Court Justice Roberts. You know that as well. What you may or may not know is that it was a bad decision. Well, that's because I don't like it, but because it actually was. Uh, the defense said it wasn't a tax. Supreme Court Justice said it was a tax. And that's the reason why it was constitutional, because you can tax anybody for anything. So if I don't have Brussels sprouts on a Tuesday, they can tax me if they decide to pass a law that says that. If I don't have cauliflower on a Thursday, that can be a law too. And we can tax you extra for that. So literally taxing for the inaction is something that's brand new to this country. Now, it relates to religious freedom the whole law. Is the fight over? No, it's not. Because if it is a tax, which the defense said it wasn't, but the Supreme Court Justice said that's the only way it's constitutional is if it's, if it's a tax, let's go ahead and see what the Constitution says about that. All bills for taxation shall originate in the House. Where did this bill start? Well, in the Senate, correct. There was a bill for health care reform that started in the House. I read that one, too. And there was a telephone conference call that was with the Medical Society of the State of New York, representatives from the American Medical Association, and doctors from New York, all over Long Island and, and throughout the state of New York. And I raised my objections, pointing out lines and what things said and what it meant, and quoting different things. And then I said, no, it doesn't say that. I said, well, it says on this page, blah, 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 blah. And I would read to them over the telephone conference call. But they didn't care. It's important. Karen is the reason why I am a doctor. And these are other doctors who just didn't care. So the House version went to the Senate and failed. They voted up? No. The Senate came up with a health care law, or a bill. They passed it, went to the House. Nancy Pelosi said, eh, this is close enough to what we passed. I'm just going to say it passed. Not the same bill. Didn't say all the same things. It's close enough. And she deemed it to pass. So the House didn't even vote on this bill. Then the bill went to the President, who gleefully signed it into law. All right. What do you need to understand about it? The American uh, Association of Physicians and Surgeons is actually still fighting out the law. There's still a court case pending out there, as well as another one from Ohio, from the uh, Pacific Legal Defense Fund, I believe is one who's running that one. So there's two court cases, both on the same grounds. 
One is the fact that uh, it violates the taking clause. I mean, the government can't take things that aren't theirs without due justice. The other part of it is the fact that the law is not constitutional because all bills of taxation must originate in the House. So that's still out there, and it's important and integral to the story. Let's proceed forward, though, with what this law actually says. It talks about a lot of taxes. That it does. A lot of penalties, a lot of fines. The IRS is the regulatory arm, a lot of stuff you guys already know. Maybe some of you don't, but there it is. From that point in time, you have to realize something, that as of next January, if they keep to the timetable, the Independent Payment Advisory Board will be deciding all decision-making for healthcare. So there's a lot of talk here about electronic medical records, electronic health records. Well, when this law passed, uh, there was a lot of, and when the stimulus law passed, because this was a little bit in the plan, the IPAB was created under stimulus one, not made in this law. Reference to this law, but not made in this law. The Independent Payment Advisory Board. That's headed by Dr. Ezekiel Manuel. Also important, as some of you may have gotten a handout or may not, I only made about 50 copies, I should have made about three times as much. Um, talking about the principal application of scarce medical resources and all that we're about. This, this board of bureaucrats, some doctors, some not, will make the decisions. You'll go to your doctor, how will this work? They'll see you. They'll say, John Smith has this diagnosis, that diagnosis, and this diagnosis. It's supposed to go real live time to Washington, D.C. via the electronic health record. It's supposed to come back to your doctor's electronic health record saying, your doctor must do A, then B, then C, in that order. How to do it, and the order it must be done in. Now, if you follow the paradigm as a doctor, and it's the wrong thing for your patient, the patient gets sicker and dies, eh. But the physician is still held medically liable, and be sued for medical malpractice. If your doctor turns around and says, this is crazy, I swore either to Hippoc or the Apollo or to God, or both, to defend the Hippocratic Oath, and I will not do this, it says you'll be fined in the law. Well, a doctor went before a House Congressional Subcommittee and asked them, what's the fine? It doesn't say. What's the penalty? First offense is $100,000 fine, is what he was told. Second offense, jail time, class D felony. How soon do you guys think this is take for the system to start collapsing? Okay. Now, back to, well, who's writing the paradigms? They must not be that bad. They won't be that bad. They'll be pretty good. They'll be mostly on target. You have pneumonia, you give this antibiotic. You have a blood clot, you give that antibiotic. You're pregnant, we'll give you the morning after pill. That's lovely. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, too. But you'll come down, this is what we're supposed to do. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He gave a grand rounds at North Shore Manhattan several years ago and wrote an article in Lancet, January 2009. That's the name of our, one of our medical journals. In the article, he talks about the principle for allocation of scarce medical resources. In the article, he proceeds to explain, and during the talk, is that people between the ages of 15 and 40 are the most productive to society. People under 15 and over 40 are not as productive to society. Now, in the grand rounds, he said, so therefore, you know, they should get less health care and maybe none at all. So, I'm sure some of us, or it's not, not me anymore. I'm sure some of you may fit into the 15 to 40 range, uh, and some of you won't. So if you're over 40, you're under 15, less or maybe none at all is Dr. Manuel's words. He said that at a podium full of a room with as many physicians as there are people right here, maybe even a few more. Most of the doctors were sleeping, or playing with the Blackberries or other iPhones or whatever. Uh, some were reading the paper. A few of us were looking back and forth like, that sounded pretty much like evil to me. Uh, and a few were very happy about it, thought it was a wonderful idea. And right on board. Typically the ones that work for the hospital system are the ones that are going to be more on board with this. At least initially. So, he said, well, 15 to 40, under 15 to over 40, less than maybe none at all. 
The biggest hurdle we're going to have is the Hippocratic Oath. We need to get physicians to ignore what's good for their patients and do what's good for society as a whole. What's good for the collective. Well, those of you old enough to remember Korea, that's collectivism, communism, statism, Nazism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. It's had different names over the centuries and over the millennium. Why does that relate? So it's thought about the Progressive Party, this concept. In the early 20th century, progressivism started like, and I won't go too much of history, but it was the United States version of fascism and communism. In Europe, they had fascism versus communism. In Russia, communism won, but they were both there initially. In Germany, fascism won. You, fascism's a little more honest than communism. People look at me strange when I say that, but it's true. Not that I like it, but it's a little more honest. They say, we're going to put a dictator in charge, and they'll run your lives. They'll know what's better for you. The communists say, we'll put a dictator in charge temporarily until everybody's equal. We have redistribution of wealth. We have social justice, but not the kind we learn about in Catholicism, where you can help your neighbor. Where if your neighbor has no coat, you give him one. When he has no food, you give him yours. Where you help others and show acts of charity and love out of your own heart. Instead, it's a little different. We'll make everybody equal. Equal ends, equal everything. Once everybody is equal in the country, then the dictatorship will step down and we'll have nobody in charge. That's the beautiful lie of communism. Because a lot of younger people will buy into it. Yeah, you know what? I can rule myself. I can be in charge. We don't need a government. Let's just go through this communist phase, because that sounds wonderful. And that's how they hook a lot of people into the Communist Party or on. In this country, it's called progressivism. They said, no, 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 dictatorships, it's a great idea, but uh, it's not working out too well over there, I don't know. And communism, a revolution, a lot of people dying right away, I don't know. Let's do progressivism, started by Teddy Roosevelt, who I used to like a lot until I realized he started the Blue Moose Party, and started progressivism the Progressive Party in the United States. I'm reading about that, I've actually been to Teddy Roosevelt's house. It's all about why not? Well, when you realize that this is the party that he started, they believe in a stepwise approach to complete control of your lives. And if you guys remember the 2008 debate, both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama called themselves progressives in the vein of the modern early 20th century progressives. The same people that brought us prohibition, the income tax, those wonderful constitutional methods that were through the Progressive Party. Going forward, another progressive, Margaret Sanger, woman who started Planned Parenthood, Hillary Clinton's hero, according to her. Here's some quotes from Margaret Sanger. Slavs, Latin, and Hebrew immigrants are human weeds, a dead weight of human waste. Black soldiers and Jews are a menace to the race. Eugenic sterilization is an urgent need. We must prevent multiplication of this bad stock. Margaret Sanger, April 1933, Birth Control Review. Or 1922. Our objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children. Women must have the right to live, to love, to be lazy, to be an unmarried mother, to create, to destroy. Their marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. The most merciful thing that a family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Margaret Sanger, editor of The Woman Rebel, 1922. Or how about we should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds, with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the black is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the black population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs in any of the more rebellious members. Margaret Sanger, 1939. That's odd. I thought progressives loved all minorities in all different races. I guess it's not true. Let's go back to fascism for a second. Gerhard Kretschmar. For anyone who's never heard me talk before, does anyone know who that is? Gerhard, Gerhard, Gerhard Herbert Kretschmar. I heard you last speak. I ah, you cheated. <laughs> <laughs> He was the first victim of the Holocaust, yes. 
It was a trial balloon. It's a T4 product. This is going to sound eerily familiar to Obamacare to some extent. Basically, Gerhard Herbert Kreischer was six months old. His parents were devout Nazis. They went to Chancellor Hitler and said, This is our child. Chancellor Hitler sent his personal physician to evaluate the child. It was found that the child was missing part of an arm, part of a leg, blind, and obviously idiotic. Therefore, Chancellor Hitler, for the good of Germany, for the good of the family, and for the good of the baby, ordered the murder. What does it have to do with Obama? Okay. Kid? I'll get to that. I'm explaining. That's Gerhard Herbert Kretschmann. Well, what does that have to do with? Because if you understand that during the T4 project, it claimed 8,000 children is an approximation. 200,000 souls, and once you include the seniors, as well as the people in the insane asylums. And then they started on the gypsies, the Jews, the priests and nuns, the teachers, the lawyers, the educated. They came after that. Some of you may or may not know the anonymous letter that was found in Germany, you may have heard that. First they came for the gypsies, but I wasn't a gypsy, so I didn't care. Then they came for the Jews, but I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't care. Then they came for the priests and nuns, but I wasn't a priest and nun, so I didn't care. Then they came for the teachers, the lawyers, and the doctors, but I wasn't one of those, so I didn't care. Then they came for me, and I looked for help, and there was no one left to care. What does this have to do with Obamacare? A lot. When you have an individual who's in charge of the Independent Payment Advisory Board, will be making all your decision making if you have Medicare or if you go on an exchange in the state of New York. They will follow the same paradigms and they must follow the same paradigms. And the individual who's in charge of that board believes 15 to 40 is most productive. Under 15 and over 40 less so maybe no health care at all. That was the initial steps in Germany before they headed to the sterilizations and the murders. So how does it relate to Obamacare? Very closely, unfortunately, if you follow paradigms from the past. I read a lot of history from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient Babylon, ancient Samaria. When you follow through time, the same story occurs again and again. Well, here we are right now in 2013. What's going to happen with Obamacare? This January, that's the paradigm that will happen. What can your doctors do about it? What I did, as of this past January, I am not, I am called not accepting of Medicare. Medicare has several different funny names and titles, and it's important for all of you to be aware of what they mean. There's participating in Medicare for doctors. There's non-participating in Medicare for doctors. Non-participating means all the paradigms for the IPAB will still apply to your doctor and your doctor will still be stuck with either giving you bad health care or possibly going to prison. There's, but they can charge you 105% and Medicare will only reimburse at 90%, 80% of the 90% that is, but if that's too much math, just remember 90% and you'll be responsible for the extra 15, unless your secretary picks it up. All the Medicare Advantage plans are going away, by the way as of this January, most of them, I should say. Next up, there's disenrolled. You would think this is a doctor who's not enrolled in Medicare. Well, yes and no. That's the title, but it still means all of the IPAV recommendations still apply to your doctor if they are disenrolled. They still must follow Obamacare. They still must follow the paradigms. They still <coughs> must do what Washington, D.C. tells them to do. They cannot vary. They cannot stray. And as of right now, there is no appeal process. So if the paradigm they come up with is good for 95% of the people, you better hope you don't fall into 5%. Or if the paradigm says, you know what, you're over 40, you broke your hip if you were 30, we'd pay for it, but you broke your hip when you're 50 or 60 or 70, we're not going to pay for it anymore. Or maybe we'll just put you on a waiting list that'll take off longer than other people. Because hey, are you still working at 70 or 80? Maybe you are, but we really got to look at age because nobody can lie about the age part. And that was Dr. Emanuel's report in his article. And I encourage you to read it if you don't see the paradigm to it, what we're talking about. Now, 
Not accepting is the last category. That's what I am. Not accepting doctor. I don't accept Medicare. What does that mean? None of Obamacare applies to me. I treat people the right way. I always have. I always will. If you know your doctor for a long time, you like them a lot, encourage them to do so. Tell them that if they're not accepting, you'll still go see them. You say, doctor has it. I can't afford to pay my doctor bills every time I go. I have Medicare. Isn't it a shame to waste it? It would be. That's why this form 1490S, as in Sierra, 1490S. What you do is you go on a computer, you have somebody go on the computer for you. Download that form. You go see a doctor who's not accepting. You'll know, at least in your heart, that you're definitively getting the right health care, at least the right health care the doctor saying it's not being influenced by Obamacare. It's not being influenced by Obamacare. It's not being influenced by, Obamacare. It's not being influenced by Washington, D.C. And if you fill out, you pay them out of pocket. You fill out form 1490S, we mail it in. And you get paid for Medicare 80% of what Medicare deemed was appropriate for the service. And then you send the claim on to your secretary. Form 1490S is not complicated. It says, what was your diagnosis? When, was you, when were you treated? Who was your doctor? And you sign the form data and mail it in with a copy of the bill from the doctor. We actually fill it out in our office for the patients and they sign it and mail it in themselves. It takes about a half, month and a half to two months to get paid from the federal government. But people have been getting paid back. Last time I gave this talk, I said, we'll see what happens. That's what we were told was supposed to happen. That is what happens. That's the best way that you as individuals, if you're not doctors, can avoid this as best as possible until we can fix something else. Religious liberties. That's odd. I thought that was one of our constitutional amendments. There's a lot of them. In fact, the first ten amendments, they felt so important that the only way the Constitution passed was inclusive of that. Otherwise, it wouldn't have passed. Freedom of religion. Well, for those of us out there that are Catholic or other denominations are Christian or Jewish, a lot of us don't believe in, I won't say all because I don't know everybody's denomination here, but I'd say, in Catholicism, at least, we don't believe in doing abortions unless rape, incest, mother's life is at risk, severe genetic abnormality for which the baby is due to suffer and die shortly after birth. That's what we believe in, as Catholics. At least I believe in it. So. Now, to say that a Catholic school or a Catholic university or a Catholic hospital must now pay for the morning after pill or for birth control when it's not something that's part of our religious faith. Yet, Obamacare says in it, the guys with the little wagons traveling to Pennsylvania, anybody know? Uh -huh. And the guys that seem to be having a lot of trouble in the Middle East, anybody know? Yeah. Muslims. The Amish and the Muslims have specific exemptions listed in Obamacare. Wait, why, why is that? Wait, oh, because you see, according to their religions, they didn't want to violate the religious tenets. Oh, excuse me? You'll violate Catholics' religious tenets, but you won't violate a Muslim's religious tenets? How I about mean, you don't violate anyone's religious tenets, but why the difference? I don't know. But why Muslims? Well, perhaps the Amish are a little easier first. They don't believe in modern health care. They don't use modern health care. Therefore, that would probably makes the most amount of sense. Okay. Therefore, they won't have to pay the penalty for not having health care insurance. No, they'd be mandated into uh, buying health care insurance. Why the Muslims? They might blow you a lot of Muslims, I know, have health care insurance. I don't get it. Well, according to the Quran, it is illegal to, or not illegal, immoral, to wager. And insurance is a type of wager. You're betting you don't get sick. <laughs> that is the explanation to why Muslims are exempt from Obamacare. Yet Catholics, no, 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 no. We can't have a bunch of priests and nuns talking about this. This is crazy. You know, most Catholics would agree with that. The Pope agrees with that's crazy. You know, most Catholics agree it's crazy. I mean, you have the occasional ones like uh, uh, Sister Manichaean. 
who uh, is you know, a section of loosely affected uh, section of nuns that uh, don't like to listen to the Pope that much and like to come out saying, everything's fine, everything's fine, go back to sleep, Obamacare's good. Look, they made an agreement. The agreement? Well, that was easy. All right. You won't have to pay for it. We'll make the insurance companies pay for it. Well, what if we self-insure? Well, too bad. Or what about, as one bishop said in a congressional hearing I actually watched in person, he had a rabbi sitting next to him, said, this would be the equivalent of saying to rabbi, look, we know you don't eat pork, we'll have it catered in, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, he said that, he said, how do you mind? But it's the same example. That's the compromise, that's the great compromise that resolved the whole issue, which is still unresolved, as you know, which is part of the reason why you guys are here. I personally am pro-life. <coughs> that's very simple, I believe it begins at conception. Not everyone in this world believes that. I'm waiting for someone to, at the very least, at the very least, file a court case saying that, hey, you know what? You can't have an abortion once brainwaves are detected. Why? The Supreme Court has said, death is the official cessation of brain activity. At the very least, shouldn't the court say, initiation of brain activity in the third <coughs> month is the initiation of life? It seems to make sense to me. Stops. Starts, birth, death. I still think it goes back to conception, but at least I can save babies from the third month on. Heck, I'll go for what I can get in the process and still keep fighting for the others. The little problem with some people that, and getting back to Obamacare in a second, but this is also about religious uh, freedoms as well. Um, I just canceled my subscription to the Catalyst. I don't know if anyone knows who that is. Bill Donahue, I'll, I'll get you, man, I promise. I wonder if you... No, no one, one second, I'll get you just one second. I'm sorry. Um, Bill Donahue is a big Catholic advocate and keeps track of a lot of things. Uh, but I was very distressed when I got my March 2013 catalyst, and I read it as I always do, and it said, the best of all possible worlds would be for the Obama administration to roll back the mandate. But since that seems unlikely, this is not a settled issue, and the door is open for our side to secure the kinds of religious liberty protections we need. However, because serious discussions are underway, we don't need our side blasting the administration at this juncture. Unfortunately, some groups have jumped just that. From the beginning, the Catholic League has been critical of the HHS mandate, while being supportive of the delicate negotiations is not always an easy walk, but is absolutely essential. I disagree. I don't think that you compromise with bullies. I don't think you compromise with people that like to push you around, say this is what you get, this is what you do, you allow bullies to do that, which is all this is, is bullying. They're going to continue to bully. Look, 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 look. I'll talk to you about... Wait, how about if I only give you my lunch money on Mondays? How about we only give the morning after pill every other month to people? No. There's not a compromise. That's the reason for religious tenets and a belief in religious freedoms. In fact, courts, just so you have an idea, in the past, and this is coming from an attorney, not from me, have actually turned around and said, no, you know what? The second that somebody's willing to compromise on the religious tenets is the second that a judge says those religious tenets obviously aren't that important to that individual. They're important to me. I'm not compromising. So, anyway, you had a question, ma'am. And I know you're waiting patiently. Unless... Yes? I wonder if the mic were positioned a little differently, if the hearing would be easier. Oh! Jeez, I hope I don't have to read the whole thing. Sorry about that. Um, if anybody didn't hear any part of it or didn't say, understand any part of it, let me know and I'll repeat, or I'll repeat afterwards. Um, but when you look at, as I said, I gave some of the copies, I'm sure some more can be made of at least part of the article. The article from Dr. Emanuel, just one more point quickly, is the fact that he talks about objections, and that's the part that I included after the little abstract. He said, the complete lives system discriminates against older people. Age-based allocation is ageism. So unlike allocation by sex or race, allocation by age is not individual discrimination. Every person lives through different life stages rather than being a single age. So even if 25-year-olds receive priority over 65-year-olds, everyone who's 65-year-olds now was previously 25. 
So basically, in English, rather than double talk, you had to shout for healthcare between 15 and 40. If you didn't use it, then it's your own darn fault. That's his own article. You can print it out. Go online, Lancet, January 2009, at Principles of Allocation for Allocation of Scarce Medical Resources by Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. Rums, and rums. you'll read about the 15 to 40. Rums, and initially he says, this is just for scarce medical resources. In his grand rounds, he turned around and said, you know, but then once we get a single payer healthcare system, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. He said in his grand rounds, actually, look, you know what? He said, our goal is to get a single payer healthcare system, socialized medicine. Whether it's directly socialized with the government running or a third party <coughs> bidding out for the job, it's all single payer. We'll cut down costs. We'll tell, but Americans like their choices. They like 17 different brands of soda. They won't want to give up their options. So we'll appeal to the compassion, because Americans are good people. We'll tell them we'll eliminate the waste, fraud, abuse, duplication, and we'll be able to provide health care for everyone. But anyone who knows math knows that's a lie. He said the population base is getting older, it's getting larger, there's always new medical advances, new surgeries, new drugs. There's no way we can provide health care for everyone. So therefore, that's where my system comes in. And the reason and the way the reason why we have to move away from the current system of triaging, you've all heard that term, and any of you that were ex-military know exactly what that term is, or in healthcare. It's basically you go and you look at the group of sick people and try to pick the sickest ones first and figure out who really needs it, try and keep them going as opposed to let's treat the plantar award on the person between 15 and 40 between as opposed to going right to the heart attack at somebody who is 65. No, no, we go to the 65 heart attack before we go to the plantar ward. But his system would say, go to the plantar ward first. Because 15 to 40, we gotta get that person back to working and walking. That's where this leads, and that's what this has to do with healthcare and Obamacare. Alright, so I could talk a dog off a meat truck, but I won't do that to you guys. So I'll take questions because. I know that a lot of people want to know stuff, and I may not be covering it, but go ahead. <laughs> Let's say, all right, 56, and I have some kind of cancer, and I have some kind of cancer, yes. and um, I go through this conventional process, and A, B, C, D, they refuse to give me what, what most people would deem to be the best treatment. Isn't there some legal nope. way that no appeals. they can be, if I'm paying taxes and there's got to be some sort of line, you know, small print or large print, you know, that if we still have a constitution, aren't there going to be some um, ways to circumvent so through lawsuits or even, even through, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes. Uh, the answer to your second question is, I don't know. The answer to your question, I, I hope so. Uh, the answer to your first question is no. Which is, the, is there a way to circumvent it, get around it, hold someone accountable, hold someone responsible? No. Um, they made it very nice uh, for themselves because the people in the government have a different health care plan. Now, unfortunately, they still have to pay the taxes on the health care plan, which they were trying to get out of over the past month. Uh, the Republicans, Democrats are trying to pass a law so that them and their aides don't have to pay the extra taxes for having the Cadillac burden of health care. Uh, but no, if you have some sort of cancer, is there anyone to appeal to? No. You better hope you have some sort of catastrophic coverage and privately owned um, catastrophic coverage. But anything through the government, uh, Medicare, I should say, or through TRICARE, or through the medical exchanges that are being set up in New York, no. In Oregon, for example, where they have uh, uh, socialized medicine, there was a woman who had recurrent breast cancer. She asked for chemotherapy. I won't go into all the specifics, but basically, uh, she got a letter from the state government saying, look, you know what? Uh, that drug is not covered by our socialized medicine in the state. It is too expensive. Therefore, uh, we're not going to cover it. However, Here's a list of doctors for physician-assisted suicide. Should you wish that option? Yeah. yeah, that's a true story. I can research on that. That is true. Because uh, sometimes you see things and you hear things you're not really sure if it's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, the drug company actually got involved and was donating chemotherapy to her. I don't know what happened there for that. 
but because of the, uh, the publicity about it. Um, and it was such a horrible event. <laughs> I know. Wait, wait okay. Uh, one up front. And this guy back there. Whatever. What is the difference between socialized medicine and Obamacare? Nothing. No. <laughs> Actually, no. There's a little bit of difference. I'm, I'm being facetious. Uh, in socialized medicine, you have two different paradigms. Let's, well, it's many different paradigms, but let's take the paradigm of the UK versus the paradigm of Canada. In the UK, you have socialized medicine. The National Health Services, I think it's called, right. uh, has, runs healthcare for most of the country, most of the UK. Um, however, you can have a secondary system that is private pay. So I, as a doctor, uh, would be salaried by the government, and I would open my office, let's say, from 9 to 2, Monday through Friday, and uh, that's it. And I would get paid X amount a year. And I close down my office at 3 or 4 o'clock to about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, open it back up for cash paying customers only. So, you got the cash, you get to come in, you get to get treated, you get to get seen, as opposed to waiting two years for cataract surgery, or three years, or longer for other things, or over a year for a hip replacement. Imagine lying in bed with a broken hip for a year, and being told, hey, yeah, then no, that's the way, sorry. Then there's the Canadian healthcare system. Canadian healthcare system is very interesting, because I find it even more so. Uh, there's a movie called uh, Sick and Sicker. Michael Moore made a movie called Sicko. But there's a movie called Sick and Sicker, put out by doctors, as opposed to uh, a liberal uh, activist. And uh, the movie's worthwhile getting and maybe showing down here one night. Because Canadian healthcare system is a little bit different. They'll show you from the patients. They'll explain what's going on. But what's most enlightening is that uh, the Prime Minister of Canada came here for stuff, for healthcare. <laughs> well, your system's so great. Now, why didn't you go there and just pay, out, pay cash, like England, UK? Ah, they have a different system in Canada. In Canada, it says, if you go outside the healthcare system, let's say you came to me, you said, Dr. Hassan, I want to see you because I have asthma, and I really need to treat it, and it's like six months to go to the doctor, and I can't breathe, and I think I'm going to die before the six months are up. And I can't wait on the waiting list. You asking me, if anyone finds out you ask me, if I turn you in or someone else turns you in, up to six months in jail and a $50,000 fine. If I say yes, and I help you, and I treat your asthma, and I get you better, I am subject for at least six months in jail and a $100,000 fine. That's the Canadian socialized medicine system. So you hear some of the myths out there. But I thought socialized medicine works so great. I thought it works wonderfully in all these different countries. <clears throat> they pick and choose data. That's the interesting thing about statistics and about political spin. If you want to look at Norway, for example, it seems to not work so bad. They keep the cost down, people get health care, this is working out pretty good. Japan, not so bad, not as good as Norway by any chance. But, you know, okay, it's, it's hanging in there. Why is the United States different? We're melting pot. We have genes from around the world in this country. In Norway, it's a very narrow genome, we call it, meaning genetic distribution. So if you give only one cholesterol pill approved for the country, it's probably going to work for everybody in that country. If you only give one high blood pressure pill for everyone in the country, it's probably going to work for everybody in the country because they're all related. Same thing. There you go. We have people from Alaska, Africa, Hawaii, Japan, China, Russia, Ukraine, you name the part of the world, Ireland, Italy, the Middle East, you name the part of the world, we have genes that have intermingled for the past 400 years, actually even longer than that, five, six hundred years, or maybe even longer. If you believe in the Vikings going across first, which I kind of do, but I don't know what that is. So you have genes from around the world all in one giant genetic melting pot. What are the chances that one drug is going to work for everyone? 
I'm not taking that bet, even if you give me great odds. So, education of medicine in this country will always fail, in my opinion, because there's no way you can account for the genetic variations. The only way it would ever succeed is if the Human Genome Project is complete, and they can analyze everyone here, including myself, and say, hey, look, at age 65, you're going to get high blood pressure, and this will be the pill for you. And you, at age 85, you're going to get high cholesterol, and this is going to be the pill for you. And you, I'm not going to even talk about that. <laughs> but that's what, that's what it is. Now, there's different people with questions, but uh, I don't know where the mic's going, so uh, go ahead. Yes, doesn't this come down to the question of, do you have your own choices, or does the government own you, which is a very repugnant concept. And already we have seen, and this does come into healthcare, because it's a part of a larger picture, there was some woman, and I've got her name, but there was some woman who was high up in the Department of Education, which I think should be abolished, and um, she said, we have to get rid of this idea that uh, your kids are yours. Um, oh, yeah. Basically, when you have kids, that's the government's. And, and, and I think that attitude is basically they're saying, we own your body. What if you believe that the government didn't give you rights or take rights away, that God gives you rights and gives you rights away, and that government is like the guard dog. Uh, the guard dog didn't give you the house or take it away. Government doesn't give you rights or take it away. And what if you believe that government has no darn business running your life? Now, the thing is, my, my question is, don't you think that this healthcare business is just a part of a larger attitude. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, now, as far as the person you're talking about, she's actually an MSNBC uh, spokeswoman, Melissa and she Harris also is professor at Tulane, I think. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but she's a, she's a college professor. And uh, yeah, she said that they weren't the governments, the children weren't the governments, they were actually collective. Uh, we, we look at children the wrong way. We see them as ours. We need to think of them as the communities. Well, I know, looking at this large room of very nice, good people, none of you have been waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning to change my son's diaper. I've been the only one doing that for the past year and a half. So, I'm my wife. I take that back. She's going to kill me. What do you mean you're the only one? <laughs> All right, me and my wife are the only two that have been ever doing that. Um, and nobody else has. Nobody's been giving them the bottle in the middle of the night. I'm going into my daughter's room, and she's three and a half, and she has a nightmare in the middle of the night. No, no, no. They're our children. They're our rights. And there's a reason why the reference, you're correct, as God-given rights. And the point is that how this all ties together, if you don't stand for religious freedom, if you don't stand for the rights that are given to us by God, that our founders understood, they were so basic, they made ten rights. The only argument for not passing the Bill of Rights from Hamilton was. That's so blatantly obvious, we don't even need to do this. That was his argument. Because it's so blatantly obvious, and Jefferson, no, no, we need to. And they did because of that, to explain yet further, uh, to make it very simple. Now, the freedom of religion is different from our freedom from religion, where you see different stories coming up of, oh, and this student who's an atheist, got their high school to pull down the Ten Commandments, and isn't that wonderful? No, it's not wonderful. They put up there for a reason, because they're a basis for our society and our culture and our country. It was founded on a Christian principle, a Judeo-Christian principle. And the Ten Commandments are integral in that. And you need to understand that, and understand what the Ten Commandments are, to understand why it's integral. And you need to understand the Constitution. And the, Bill of, and the Bill of Rights, but also the Declaration of Independence to understand why all of this ties together. And that once you say this all goes to the government, and the government can do all this stuff, then you're heading back towards a road to serfdom and a monarchy. Well, for the first time in this country, a road to serfdom, not back in the world. Uh, up here, I guess. Oh, wait, you've got the mic. There we go. I have the toy. <laughs> um, one of the factors that they don't talk about that's creating the cost of healthcare to go through the roof is malpractice insurance and all the fraudulent activity and deceptive practices that um, are robbing the elderly of proper care. Billing, uh, both of my parents have passed away and I dealt with issues um, where 
They were being billed for medicine and vitamins that never arrived. And I think that these issues were addressed, that proper care could be given to the masses if we could bring down the cost of all this fraudulent billing that's going on and the malpractice insurance that's really driving the cost of health care through the roof. Now, in reference to that, that's actually interesting. Remember part, I referenced part of that earlier, and right? I'll speak closer just so to make sure everyone hears me, is that Dr. Manuel had said in his lecture, once we eliminate the waste, the fraud, the abuse, and duplication, we still won't be able to provide health care for everyone. One of the most effective ways, and some of you are old enough to remember this, is back when we had the little type of catastrophic coverage. You went to the doctor, you paid out of pocket. You went, you got, you bought a drug from the pharmacy, you paid out of pocket. It was before the age of PPOs, HMOs, and this, that, and the other thing. You only had catastrophic coverage. But also, you didn't have as many medical lawsuits. Well, some are legitimate. Oh, I was going in for an amputation of my right leg, cut off my left. That's a big problem. Every doctor in the world, or not every doctor, but most doctors have a big problem with that. Um, every doctor should have a big problem with that, but most don't. You left an instrument in someone's body. You uh, were supposed to give them, uh, oh, I don't know, diazepam, give them digoxin, and the heart stop. Um, there are literally lots of legal lawsuits. Anyone's in favor of tort reform, like myself, wants nothing touched with legitimate malpractice suits. Interestingly, in the state of Texas, they passed tort reform. They dropped the cost of malpractice insurance to a doctor like myself by 50%. They dropped the cost of health care to all of you. How much you paid in your premiums and your co-pays deductibles? By 20%. A decrease. Why? Because doctors weren't worried about frivolous lawsuits anymore. They just practiced good medicine. And they didn't worry about getting sued over, oh, but doctor, this could have been curry curry. Oh, really? Oh, are, you, are you kidding me? You know, like this weird disease that I, like, I kind of remember from medical school? Yes, I, I guess it could have been. It could have been very, very curry curry. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different diseases out there that I could, I could uh, befuddle you with the names that exist. No, you can't remember it all. I'm not a computer. I'm an imperfect human. I make mistakes all the time. But I try very hard and stay up nights worrying, did I write the right drug? Did I write the right dosage? Did I do the right thing for my patients? Because I can kill somebody with the movement of my pen. That's literally how bad it is, or a stroke on a keyboard. I literally saw a patient the other day who fortunately didn't die, but uh, was seen at a walk-in center. And, they, and it was the bizarrest thing. Came to the walk-in center, brought me the list of drugs that they gave him for his, uh, uh, his pneumonia. And as opposed to an antibiotic, he gave him a blood pressure pill. And they both started with the same few letters. But somebody just tapped the wrong thing on the keyboard and off it went to the pharmacy via e prescribed and uh, the pharmacist said, oh, okay, this patient needs this drug and that's the end of it, have a nice day. And he took it for a week, didn't die of pneumonia, thank God, and didn't die of the medication, thank God. But literally, I said, I think you do what, I'm sorry. And he showed me the pills, I'm like, and yeah, I've been taking this, but I haven't really been making the pneumonia better. I'm like, well, that's a good reason. And I explained it to him, he's like, Holy crap! I said, yeah, I know. That's the way life is. So mistakes do happen, but you know, that's one of the problems that I find with electronic health records is that you can easily make a mistake and it's a lot harder to undo it. Um, whereas if you write it, you just have to worry about the bad penmanship, which mm, I'm not going to make any comments about anyone else's penmanship, let's just put it that way. Uh, but someone else's. I would like to know if you can explain to me what exactly constitutes the difference between the Congress's insurance and, let's say, a federal government employee's insurance versus a, 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 a private citizen's the rest of us insurance. Patients. That's easy. A lot. <laughs> um, if you're an employee of the federal government, you have some sort of contracted, you have some sort of contracted um, government insurance plan, meaning that, like, let's say you work for the state of New York. You have an empire plan of United Healthcare. You could be a teacher, you could be a cop, you could be uh, an assemblyman, uh, you could be a senator. 
of state center, that is. And that's the healthcare plan you have. Uh, what's the deal? It's a PPO. That's all it is. Nothing special, nothing fancy. Some of them still need referrals for different things, and some of them don't. Um, it's just, they don't pay for it. We do, but they don't. As taxpayers. Taxpayers pay for it themselves when the jobs pay for it. That explains those two very easily. The federal government employees, kind of the same thing. With the exception of Congress, White House, and the cadre of the Washington, D.C. government plan, which is a little bit different. They have their own hospital, they have their own doctors, they have their own radiology facilities, they have their own gyms. They have their own, you name it, they have it. Uh, why? Because they can. I mean, Jefferson, I believe it was Jefferson, do not misquote me. Uh, and I don't remember the law, so maybe I shouldn't say who said it. But the undoing of the, uh, the Republic would one, be once the people realize they can vote themselves money. That's the problem. Is that once yes, sir, the politicians sir. realize, hey, we can vote ourselves a raise. Hey, we can vote ourselves this wonderful health care plan that nobody else gets. Hey, we might be able to get away with not paying the extra taxes from Obamacare, but just for members of Congress. Yeah. Um, not thanks, but no thanks. You're no longer representing the people at that point in time. That was Cicero who said it. Cicero, thank you. In Rome. I, I'm like, I'm trying to remember it. Um, it doesn't make And let's get that because I know they're Okay, that's great. Why aren't more doctors speaking up? Well, as I said, there was a section of doctors in that grand rounds I attended that were more than pleased to punch to walk down the road with a T4 project and a, a Nazi Germany or a Stalinist uh, Russia and uh, extermination of different patient populations that were extraneous to production in society from the good workers. Um, the majority of doctors were sleeping, and they still are. The older doctors are ticked off beyond belief, and most of the vast majority, because they do pay attention a little more, and they realize what's coming, and as opposed to somebody was saying earlier, and this is true, in all of my, I go to four different hospitals, in all the uh, medical lounges, I hear the same thing, the older doc's talking about how they're going to retire earlier. In fact, I, I've given like spur of the moment talks in different medical staff lives when people, when the topic comes up and I chime in, I start quoting all this stuff, they look at me like, holy crow, you don't even know who you are. Who are you again? And it's like, and let me tell you why and what's going on. And yeah, a lot of them don't know. A lot of them don't realize. The ones that do have a clue that are older are looking at retiring. Some doctors have moved already. Um, doctors that were retiring five years will retire now. Or when the mandates start to come in next year. A lot of doctors are starting to figure out more and more, oh, something's getting screwy here. I'm getting a lot more audits from my charts. In fact, there's a report from the AAPS that Medicare chart audits for doctors is up 30% this year. So that's a lot more charts you now have to put out there, get all the records together. You get what will happen is as follows. Doctors that have half a brain will get a clue, hopefully, and completely jump out of Medicare. Like I do. Doctors without half a brain will see their practices dwindle more and more as they get put under the thumb. They might join a healthcare institution, which will be a temporary safe haven, or an IPA. Some of you guys have seen IPAs appear by your doctor's names. Um, there's different health facilities that have different IPAs. Or all of a sudden the hospital's bored with this practice. And now your doctor works for that hospital, which if your doctor works for a hospital, even as their doctor that you've seen for 50 years, if all of a sudden they have a contract with the hospital and are subject to the Obamacare mandates. So unfortunately that will occur. And then when, they re when the mandates start coming in and the doctor starts realizing, oh, I didn't think I was signing up for this, they're going to either have to retire or leave the state or just suck it up and do the little of Satan. Um, the doctors who are catching the clue are going to jump out and they're trying to continue to survive hopefully enough, we'll continue to wake up and band together. The only thing I can see in New York potentially is if you can get enough doctors to create a wellness center. What's a wellness center? I don't know, I just made up the term. 
Um, Start paying with chickens. But if you got a whole bunch of doctors together, you had orthopedic surgeons, cardiologists, pulmonologists, neurologists, you name the ologists and the itchists and you name whatever. I mean, I'm sure some of you people have more doctors than I can even count. Um, and some of you haven't seen a doctor in years. But the reality is if you can get enough doctors together and not create a hospital or a medical center that would be regulated by the state and subject to the feds, but as they create a center where everyone can get together and then people would voluntarily pay their own money to belong to this center, a completely different paradigm than anything that's existed. You exist at this center, you go to this center, you pay for the center, and it's yours. You own it. So it's not really a hospital, so they can't tell you what the temperature of the water is supposed to be. They can't tell you how many ways you have to clean the chandelier while you're ignoring whether or not the patient gets food or IV fluids. How about the old style hospital where actually you're trying to take care of the patients and you ignore some of the stuff that's not as important? Does the outside facade look as nice? No. I care more about the patient getting good care on the inside. Are they actually being treated the right way? Uh, actually, this guy, because he's the way off. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes, you. The Independent Review Board. There's nobody on it at the moment. Dr. Manuels. But that could be appointed by the President, Correct. approved by the, uh, the Senate. And if they filibuster, and there's nobody there at the moment, you know who decides? HHS. HHS. That's correct. Sibelius. Uh, he's appointed about, in fact, the second that it was passed, uh, not the second that it was passed, but shortly after it was passed, he did appoint a whole bunch of people. They have not been vetted yet. They may never be vetted. But then once that occurs, ta-da! Have a nice day. Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry. The, the somebody back there next. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. The latest thing I just read is that the Republican uh, majority leader and the Democrat majority leader are each to appoint six members each to the IPAC. And the president appoints three. And um, the um, Boehner and McConnell have refused to appoint their uh, six members to the board. So what happens then? You don't have the 15, you complement the 15 members. The secretary shall determine. Read the bill. Yeah. HHS secretary will decide. Yeah. It won't matter. If they, see, the reason why it's probably better not to appoint anybody to the death panel is because it'll be labeled the death panel, but it'll be called bipartisan. If it's only known as a democratic death panel, it looks bad politically once they start coming out with, hey, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't have your mammogram so often. Maybe you shouldn't get that PSA. They're not really useful. Maybe you shouldn't get that hip surgery at that age because you're a little too old. Um, that's that. There's somebody that's dying right here. Oh, yes, thank you. You're coming at time. You say something new. It's something I haven't heard for the most part. That was a little hard conservative media. Hold the mic up. There's a, as you know, there's a, a big disconnect between what's really going on, what you see, and then what's presented. And uh, the one thing that's out in the media right now is the, the Kermit Gazzanella trial. And uh, there, of course, liberal media outlets are playing that down as an aberration that, doesn't, that has nothing to do with the industry and the industry is safe. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we're here for, because we are guardians or we, we respect and we, we desire our religious liberty. But, um, but this administration and Obamacare is a perfect example of, uh, of, a, of an act or a law that has no regard for our, for our uh, viewpoint on life. And uh, you mentioned something before, I just wanted to make a correction. John Paul II never condoned, never would have approved any abortion except in the case of uh, the if the life of the mother is at risk. But that case legitimately is so rare as if never happened. So, but he would never condone for rape or for incest. Um, but in any case, where do we go from here? Where's the Achilles heel? Where can we make a connection between the treatment of the Muslims and their, uh, their past? And how can the Catholics or Christians or pro-lifers get in there? Okay. Um, okay. In, in regards to uh, Kermit Gosnell, absolutely horrified at the whole situation. For those of you who don't know, I'm not going to spare you uh, the gory details. But basically, 
uh, a horrible individual, in my opinion, uh, who committed a lot of late-term abortions and would deliver children and kill them afterwards. Okay? We'll leave it at that. Um, there's a lot more you can read about, but there's no need to go into it and mix out through um, As far as the other stuff, it comes from Vatican II Council, uh, specifically when they talk about rape, incest, mother's life, risk, the, the things that were okay, uh, and, or, okie dokie if you will, um, where it wouldn't be a mortal sin. But going on to your point is we really make the connection between the Muslims and Catholics well, that is the point to make. Why is it that Muslims' religious freedom is honored and Catholics aren't? And perhaps that should be, as you all go out there as soldiers of God, as, or uh, just soldiers of freedom, depending upon if anybody doesn't believe, uh, to go out there and say, wait a second, why is it that we can turn around and say that Muslims' religious freedom and religious beliefs should be honored and Catholics' religious beliefs should not. And that should be appealed to just about anyone. Republican, Democrat, Independent, Jewish, Christian, even some Muslim, Hindu, Atheist, whatever. Wait a second, you either believe it or you don't believe it. It's either religious freedom for all, or hey, we can start to pick and choose who gets to vote, who gets to drive a car, who gets to do whatever. That's where the problem lies is you're no longer talking about a free country anymore. At that point, you're talking about the evolution into a dictatorship where people get to decide in the government, not necessarily one individual, but a tyranny, if you will, where a government body gets to decide who gets what and how and when and where. And we'll decide based upon whatever we want. And who cares about the Constitution either? The Constitution is actually supposed to be our contract with the government with the people, the states, and the federal government. That's the concept behind it. It's a contract. So that means everybody has to obey the contract. Because we have a constitutional amendment to pay income tax, we all should be paying our income tax. Because we have a constitutional amendment for, to, uh, at the time of prohibition, nobody should have been drinking. Then once it's repealed, everybody should be drinking, if they want to. Want to, not to, but should be drinking. <laughs> Um, but that's the contract. So if everybody has religious freedom, everybody in theory does. If you're willing to violate it on that clause, that's where I have the objections to Mr. Donahue saying, hey, he's off and some delicate negotiations. Delicate my foot. We either have religious liberties or we don't. You don't get to, well, you know what, we'll take a little bit of religious liberty on a Tuesday. No, that's not our belief system. None of the churches should be mandated to pay for any of um, But, yes, this lady right My husband is a retired fireman, and he retired, the, um, we pay our own empire into the fire department. I can send it in out of his pension. It's 760 something thousand a month. Will that change come January? Will that go way up? Or? Uh, yes. Will it change in January? Yes. Will it go way up? Probably. Not definitely. Uh, probably. Because what will happen is, they'll start to say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We can't afford this budget in New York State anymore. We can't afford the increase in health care costs that we now have to shell out. So therefore, we've got to figure out a way to pay for the fireman's pension and the amount that they pay in, that extra double or triple the cost of what they were paying for all the retired firemen? I know we made a contract with them, but it's a bad economy, times have changed, things are going on. Don't look for help from Albany so much. You might get it if there's enough firemen that are willing to put enough political pressure against representatives, <laughs> assemblymen, and state senators to say, you guys are out of your freaking minds. Uh, I mean, specifically why we have exchanges in New York? Governor Cuomo said so. Uh, it didn't go through the assembly and the Senate. He just wrote an executive order. Just another dictate from a different tyrannical leader. And the result will be, yeah, it's going to have to go up or always going to have to soak up the extra bill. Because the cost of Obamacare, the next 10 years originally before passage, was 900 something billion dollars. 
They kept it under a trillion. Say, look, it's under a trillion dollars. <coughs> then shortly after past year, it was 1.6 trillion. Now the GAO two months ago said it was 6.2 trillion. At least we haven't calculated all the other effects. So you're telling me we have a $16 trillion national debt and we're going to spend another $6.2 trillion on this monstrosity that violates people's religious freedoms as well as heads down the road of something horrible? That's crazy in my mind, but that's me. Uh, my, my other question was how will this affect chiropractors? The same way if they take Medicare. The same exact way. If they are, remember the magic term, not accepting. It's not disenrolled, it's not not participating. It's not accepting of Medicare. If the chiropractor is not accepting of Medicare, then you're going about your business, have a nice day. Uh, if the patient, if the doctor is anything but not accepting, the paradigms will apply. It may be, hey, you know what? We're gonna completely mess over all chiropractors and no one's allowed chiropractic services anymore. We're only between the ages of 15 and 40, or whatever we decide because we pulled out of the hat. Maybe it'll be Hindus on Wednesdays and Christians on Tuesdays. I don't know. I got the toy. Hi, I got the toy. Um, as a student of the Constitution and a freedom lover, this is so repugnant that we could spend months talking about this. So let's move on. That there is one aspect of this government takeover of healthcare that literally scares the hell out of me, which nobody's talking about, which is basically we've always counted on the brightest and the best amongst us to go into the field of medicine because it was the most important thing to keep us alive. And I mean, how do you, every doctor I know, they're telling their kids, don't even think about it. Um, I'd like to get your opinion on that and what it's going to mean to our future health care. I have a three and a half year old. I have an almost two year old. Um, you can imagine my house is very quiet. <laughs> how is it going to affect that? If things, I feel like, I told somebody earlier today, I was giving them a brief synopsis of what I talk about, and she looked at me and I said, I feel like it goes to Christmas future. If these things do not change, this is your future, Ebenezer Scrooge. Mm -hmm. um, and if things do not change, no, I wouldn't let my daughter or my son go into healthcare. As a nurse, as a doctor, as an aide, as a, <coughs> you name it. I mean, I can't stop them physically, but I would strongly verbally discourage them. Uh, from doing it because they'll be losing their soul in the process. They will have that option of will you sell your soul to the devil and do what the government says and risk the malpractice suits at the same time that you're selling your soul or will you turn around and do the right thing and wind up in prison and daddy will have to make your cake with a file on it. Uh, that's literally where we're at. So yeah, no, I've been advising my kids along those lines, I would been advising. I will advise my kids that if this does not change. If it does not change, and let's say there's a couple of things that you need to know about, other things that potentially can occur, let's say New York State says, all right, in order to be licensed in New York State, you must accept exchanges, <coughs> state exchanges. Go to Texas. I live in New York. I suggest you do the same if you want to live. If they say, you know what? Um, Almost everyone wants upon exchanges, like the woman who was husband, uh, the fire department, retired fire department. Almost everyone's going to be put on exchanges, all the pension plans are convert to exchanges, everyone will convert to exchanges, and then practically no one can see me anymore. I can't get enough patients to pay for my kids uh, going to Catholic school in the future and going to college, etc. Yeah, then you know what? I have to move too. It's the second way of moving. Next point is uh, rather quickly a little bit of homework for you guys, just so you know. Not homework for you, but homework I've done for you is uh, there's a couple different plans out there for secondaries. Try and shy away from ARP. Remember they helped get Obamacare passed. Um, religious not exception for Christians at all. There's Generation America. If you call them up, you want to ask about a Plan N, as in Nancy or Navajo. Plan N is a supplemental, which is why the reason ARP put it in, because once most of the Medicare Advantage plans go away next January, January 2014, by the way, quickly approaching. Once that happens, you guys start to get your letters. If you have Medicare HMOs like Emblem Medicare or GHI Medicare, or Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicare, 
or United Medicare, to name some of them, once they go away, and you get your letters, hey, they're going away as of January, you have to get a secondary. A lot of people will flock to ARP because it has a common name to it, not realizing they're the ones that brought you this disaster in the first place, or one of the ones. What do you call that generation one? Generation America, Plan Navajo. You want to ask where they will sell in New York. And then they'll help you out with figuring out like what type of plan, just a lot of a deductible, and a $20 copay or something like that. And it was about $303 a month, I think, is what it was. Uh, I called up AMAC. Mm -hmm. AMAC, American Mature Association, I don't remember. AMAC, AMAC. Um, uh, they were about $305 a month uh, for their plan F, and same thing, kind of need to buy a drug plan as well, or enroll through the government drug plan. It's always going to be the government drug plan, either of those two. Nobody's selling an independent, nobody's selling an independent drug plan. So that's something you kind of need to do. Uh, then there's like another guy who called me and told me about his plan, which was cheaper, it was like $67 a month, oh, that's great for a secondary plan, but it was a deductible of $2,110 a year, uh, so it's something to potentially look into. Uh, there are different ones out there, but personally, I, I picked somebody who was fighting against Obamacare and still fighting against Obamacare, which would be one of the, you know, one of those, as opposed to ARP, <laughs> it's the bottom line, and I don't work for any insurance companies. And don't I'm particularly ARP like them either, but that's besides the point. Uh, Correct. Your Medicare pays 80% of the bill for a contracted doctor. So like, let's say, for example, I'll just give you a, a number of example. The, they'll say for, for you to come to my office, they'll pay me 100, I, I just paid Medicare. I don't, but let's say I did. Uh, you want to come to see me. They'll pay me $100 if you come see me. They'll authorize $100. Medicare will pay $80, and AARP or Generation America or uh, AMAC will pay 20 that's what the secondary plans do. Medicare sets the price, and AMAC or Generation America give the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. There's different plans, like ones that pick up the donut hole, ones that don't pick up the donut. Like, there's a whole bunch of different variations. Well, wouldn't Medicare deny you of, say, your 50 or 60, and Medicare, wouldn't it go through that kind of a... Oh, yeah, you know, this is for people that have Medicare already. If you don't have Medicare yet, you're 50 years old, let's say, and you're not on Medicare because you're still working, you have your private insurance already. And if you don't have your private insurance, you have to buy it yourself, either from an insurance broker or off the exchanges. But I highly advise using an insurance broker rather than an exchange, because anything off the exchange will be subject to the government mandates. Anything that buy through an insurance broker will be more expensive, and you'll have to pay a tax on it, but at least you'll get good health care. The question is, what do you want to pay for? And if the answer is, well, if you can't afford it, you know, you shouldn't be eating dog food and, and getting, you know, great health care. That doesn't make any sense. But at the same point in time, if you can afford, it's, and it's not a lot more from what my patients have told me, for these compared to ARP. So, if it's, if it's close, you switch from ARP to Generation America or AMAC. Uh, or, you know, one of the other ones that fights against it. And there are other ones out there. Um, are refusing to join into this? Yes. Like yes. Some states have passed laws saying that we're not honoring Obamacare. We're not going to set up the exchanges. In fact, yes. roughly approximately half the states say we're not doing it, and half the states are saying we're doing it. 29 or something. So then what happened? Uh, the states that aren't doing it by the health care law, the feds must set up a federally run state exchange. That they'll run the state exchange for Texas. But the state government will have nothing to do with it. Now, why would the states then not just do it? Well, easy. If you do it in your state, the state of Texas, for example, or the state of New York, New York's doing it. New York has to expand the threshold for their Medicaid rules. So they'll put a lot more people on Medicaid, in exchange for which they'll get money for the first two years. And after the first two years, then all figure out how to put the bill for that and still pay for the fireman's pension increase, which they don't have any money for. Either one of those. But somehow, magically, they'll figure out how to do that. So Governor Cuomo, with infinite wisdom, said, we're doing it. Executive order, done. State of Texas says, we're not doing it. 
They don't expand their role, expand their Medicaid roles. They don't get the extra money from the federal government. But, however, any insurance company in the state wants health care is completely up to the state of Texas. So if GHI or Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Healthcare or uh, Mutual of Omaha or anybody wants the health care insurance out of Texas, they get to run health care any way they want. You get more traditional types of health care insurance. Some states pass constitutional amendments, like Ohio and Wyoming. So, in fact, uh, some people, have, some states have passed laws saying it literally as a constitutional amendment. Uh, no part of Obamacare may be put into place by any government official within the state, and any official that attempts to enforce any part of Obamacare within the state will be subject to a state felony. South Carolina. That's one of them. Yeah, this this several. So are, yeah. Yes, that is correct. And that may be a possibility. But we'll see. It's a question of whether or not New York collapses or it doesn't. If Obamacare collapses because, I don't know, let's see, everyone starts getting their letters in the fall and they keep by the timeline and people start realizing, the vast majority of populace out there start realizing, what the hell is this? I was watching Dancing with the Stars as opposed to paying attention to Obamacare. I had my head in the sand, and now all of a sudden I'm going to have to figure out how to pay for a secondary? I can't afford that. What's going on? And enough people wake up, then you might have a big 2014 election. And then after that, you might also see a lot of politicians, both Democrat and Republican, going, oh no, oh no, oh no. Look, we really got to do something about this uh, Obamacare. We're going to have to postpone it, or get rid of it, or modify it, or and they'll start getting nervous. Why? Because the only way you can really hit a politician is where it hurts, not getting reelected. Past that, they really don't care. They can promise you the moon, the stars, the sky up above, they really won't care. Uh, the bottom line is for the majority of politicians, they care about getting reelected and having power and money. That's about it, unfortunately. You might need term limits, but that's a different discussion. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Second of all, we need to get you on the circuit. <laughs> Because there are so many people that are just, as Mark Levin would say, unconscious. Yes. About what's going on. This will be YouTube, by the way. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Great to put this on YouTube. <laughs> My question is, the AMA. Yes. They sold their soul to the devil. Yes, they did. What happened? Easy. As I said, I talked on that uh, telephone conference call. But they proceeded to support it. Oh, blah, 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 this is wonderful. That was because of the House version. They didn't have one for the Senate version. Because that wasn't part of the AMA anymore at that point. I dropped my membership as well as my membership to all my other medical societies that supported Obamacare. Well, I can't say 100% for sure. Because I'm not them, the people that made the decision. But I will give you an idea. And you can make the speculation and theory on your own. Most of the medical societies, including the AMA, are located in what city? I'll take one answer from one person. Raise your hand. D.C. Nope, nope, nope. Chicago, Illinois. Oh, great. When this occurred, and I said, I can't believe this conversation with the AMA. I can't believe they're actually supporting this. I can't believe the person on the phone is telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm quoting him sections of the bill. Because I had it on my computer. I had points noted, they had all written out stuff. And then I would quote things and it would get silence on the other end of the line on a telephone call. Now, some of you are old enough to remember party lines. We used to have them when I was a kid. I'm on a party line. There's silence? Really? I asked for the, for the, uh, um, the not the charter, but the, uh, not the SOPs either. Bylaws. Basically, the uh, bylaws. The bylaws, thank you. The bylaws for the AMA. And uh, they said, oh, well, you can look, you know, we can't send those to blah, 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 blah. I want to find them in my line. And I realized something. And this is where I say, I'm only human. I make mistakes too. I belonged to the AMA for years. I had no clue how it operated. Now I do. But I didn't up until this point. And I did it because I'm like, oh, my doctor, I guess I should be part of the AMA. Eh, whatever. Uh, when you join back in medical school, because that's where they get a lot of people, when you join back in medical school, it's like, hey, we'll give you the first year for free. Okay, whatever, I don't know, I just joined. Um, 
Yeah, the bylaws, you don't vote for, member, for the board of directors of the AMA. You don't vote for the president of the AMA. So less than 10% of doctors actually belong to the AMA, by the way. A lot of things that people don't understand, don't realize. That number's dropped since Obamacare. Because a lot of docs got fed up like I did, just said, goodbye. They won't, quote, they won't post the new roles if they haven't seen them. Well, the AMA, if you belong to another association like the American Academy of Chest Physicians, or the American Thoracic Society, or the American Academy of Cardiologists, and you belong to the AMA, the other society can decide how many people and who they want to send to the AMA as representatives. Okay. Then all those representatives from all those secondary societies are proportional. So if you have, I forget the numbers, but if you say like, you have 10,000 people that belong to the AMA and the American Association of Cardiologists, well, let's just send 10 people, 10 delegates. So you send your 10 delegates to the meeting, for the AMA meeting, and all the delegates from the armed forces, from all the different uh, uh, sub-organizations, they go there and they have a vote on members of the board, 12 member board. And now you have the 12 members. The 12 members then sit down and say, okay, from us 12, let's select the president. So what say did I have when the AMA when I was part of it? None. If I was only the AMA, what say did I have? Absolutely not. I couldn't even have a say in a subspecialty society unless I belonged to one that sent the delegate over. To then maybe one day at some point in time, out of 100 people or 1,000 people, they might listen to you and say, okay, well, I'll vote for this guy or this girl for a uh, member of the board. So what happened to the AMA? Well, it's possible you only had to corrupt or convince or bribe or whatever 13 people, 12 members of the board and the president. That's it. And, so, and they're all located in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> when they have the meetings, that is. I mean, it is. Some, I'm sure, <laughs> around different board members from different parts of the country, but uh, the headquarters is in Chicago. So not really a lot of, hard to figure out. And when the president of the AMA went on his jolly ride on Air Force One, yay! Maybe that's what his bribe was. Like, if you ride on Air Force One, a lot of guys in the back. I don't know. It sounds great. You know, it's it's insanity like that that kind of frustrates you. But there's a lot of people with questions. Hold on. Got all plenty of questions. First, I'm sorry, Doctor. This is the third time I've no, heard no. you, and I want to thank you for your words and wisdom. Uh, like the gentleman said, thank you for letting us know because so many of our seniors don't know what the hell's going on. I've spoken to my organization, the CSA, etc. I have a question, though. Okay. Large corporations um, can dump their employees yeah. under certain conditions, uh, take a $2,000 fine, and in lieu of paying perhaps $17,000, $18,000 for insurance. Yep. Now, my question comes, hey, what about New York City, New York State? Aren't they large corporations? Wouldn't that kick us in the teeth? Yes. And that's where I was explaining to one in the back before, is the fact that, uh, yeah, all these guys are trying to figure out where they're coming up with all this money. It'll be us, the taxpayers. That's what they're called it. Yeah. A politician never worries that much about spending money because it's not theirs to spend. It's not like you see them all on a regular basis taking money out of their pocket and saying, and I'll take this whole room full of people out to dinner tonight. No, 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 no. It's usually, well, I'll spend other people's money. Where does the money come from? Oh, some nebulous pot somewhere. Oh, yeah. Where did the money in the pot come from? Well, the taxpayers. Okay, but can you track your individual money? If you, that would be a great app for smartphones. Here's your taxes for the year, you pay your IRS taxes, and you get to find out where your individual money went. Hey, look, my money, my money went to studying the sexual orientation of hamsters. What? My money went to turtle trails. What? You know, my money went to, and then you start to get more and more upset about it, if you will, uh, as you start to realize this isn't so good or the way it was originally intended. The guy in the back had a question. I'm going to get to you because you have the magic microphone. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to address him with the AMA. The AMA is another extortion. Another extortion. 
they have exclusive rights to publish the codes that doctors have to use for billing. Yeah. Okay, and the uh, next one is the ICD-10, which is much more complex. It's going to cost more money, and it's going to come out of your pockets, and it's going to affect your health care. Uh, yes, you are absolutely correct on all points. Um, it's one of the more interesting paradigms of it. We get the support from the guy, the guy, the people we're paying money to. Okay, well, that's really not a lot of support, but or at least ethical support, I should say. And yes, ICD-10 is going to be horrific. Now, even the private insurance companies are going to start using ICD-10, and now AMA and AAPS have all of a sudden, well, AAPS has always, AAPS has always been on board, but the AMA all of a sudden welcomes up, whoa, 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 maybe we should delay this implementation of this ICD-10 stuff, because this seems a little crazy. I don't know, there's like nine different codes when you get bit by a dog, and your doctor better put down the right code, or nobody's getting paid. What? That's insane. How about just bit by a dog? Why do you care if it's bit on the shin, or bit on the elbow, or bit, on, bit by a large dog, or a small dog, or a Pekingese? Well, this makes no sense. There's several different codes for being bit by a parrot. Bit by a parrot. There's several different codes for burns on water skis. I don't know as much reimbursement we'll have to shell out, and we'll we'll mess over the doctors and the hospitals more. The other part of it is that if we know that you got bit by a Pekingese and you don't have a Pekingese, where were you? We have more knowledge about your location, your activities. Maybe it's like wiretaps on the Associated Press. We just want more knowledge so we have more control, more ability to blackmail. Um, there's plenty of reasons to do things. I can always speculate in theory as far as the reasons go. But this man had the magic microphone. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, it's been said that 7 million people that already have their health care will lose it. Is that true? And why is it so? I don't know if it's 7 million people, I, won't, I don't want to answer the question, I don't know, uh, because it would be not ethical of me. Uh, but people will lose their health care insurance, and why will people lose their health care insurance? Well, as the gentleman stated before, when companies start saying, wait, 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 wait a second, I have these full-time employees, I could pay $2,000 and not give them health care insurance as a fine, or I could pay $18,000 for the same employee, and give them the health care insurance. I'll pay the fine. Simple as that. And people will lose the health care insurance because companies will just go, it's financially, it just doesn't make sense. What are you doing? The actuaries and the accountants that work for these organizations to retain their licenses and privileges are going to do what's right for the company fiscally, not necessarily ethically. And they will say to the company, CEOs and directors and presidents, look, you can keep them with health care insurance, but you can get rid of them, pay the fine. You'll save X amount of millions or X amount of billions or whatever the case may be. So that's where people are going to wind up on the short end of the stick, so to speak. Now, individuals, if you don't have to get your health care insurance, let's say you pay the tax, fine, tax, whatever they want to call it, on Tuesday, $1,250. Okay. How much does health care insurance cost? Well, I'm all in that state of New York. You're talking 8,000. So, I'm young, I'm healthy, I fit in the 15 to 40 year old grade, let's say. I don't, but let's say I don't. Let's say I'm female. I get pregnant. I get multivitamins every day because I want a good, healthy child. And I'm a little skip on the ultrasounds because, hey, they didn't happen years ago, so why not? I start to go into labor. Okay, I'm going to call up United Healthcare. And ask them for health care insurance. That's the problem with the not removing people from pre existing conditions. So I can fly, not paying $8,000 a year, but pay $1,250 a year until I get pregnant, diagnosed with cancer, break a leg, and call up the insurance company on the way to the hospital and say, I want health care insurance, and the company by the law cannot refuse me. Yeah. And they get one year's premium in exchange for hundreds of thousand dollars bill from the hospital. All of our premiums have been going up because of this law. And that's the reason why. The actuaries and the bean counters know exactly how health care insurance works. They know why and everything about money. So if you understand how the payment schedules work, how and why insurance works, and how it's risk stratification over a large group of people, but if you know that more and more people are going to start figuring this little naughty secret out in Obamacare, the premiums will go up and up and up. 
And eventually what will happen is either one of two things. Well, what will happen is the premiums will be so high that very few people will be able to afford it. The rest will either have no health care and pay the fine and get messed over. The private insurance companies will go out of business. The people will cry out, we can't get health care anymore because there aren't enough doctors. Government, you have to do something to help us. And that will be the way to socialize medicine. Because they will help us. And then we'll have Dr. Emanuel helping to make decisions for who gets what. And it'll be quite lovely, I'm sure. Um, hey, doctor, yeah. a version of that took place in Massachusetts. Yes. Romney care. Correct. The same thing that you just described is Correct. going on in Massachusetts. And that's why you have several hospitals on the verge of bankruptcy in Massachusetts Correct. as well. Wow. Because you cannot do something. So even though the denial of pre-existing sounds wonderful, you're like, you won't be able to deny people with pre-existing anymore. It's actually not good. It doesn't work with the system. How about you do something better? How about you do something like Dr. Ben Carson said? Yeah. Increase medical savings accounts. Give you account numbers when you're born. And everybody in your family can donate to the baby's account. The account can only be used for health care, not pay off a credit card or a car or pay off a, a, a mortgage or you know, pay off whatever. You can only use for health care. You continue to contribute in your whole life. People continue to shell money into it as well. And if something, God forbid, happens to a little kid, or from the time they're born, their parents can afford catastrophic coverage, the old type, and they can afford the catastrophic coverage, so that, God forbid, the little one develops leukemia, they'll still be covered, and the cost will be affordable, because, thank God, <coughs> leukemia is not that common, that it's so widespread that it would cause the premiums to be a free roof. So, that system would work, the only thing in Obamacare, and friends have asked me, is there anything good in the law? Well, one thing, I said if a full-time student wants to stay on their parents' health care insurance <coughs> up until the age of 26, and the parents want them to stay on their health care insurance up until the age of 26, they can't. Pass that, all the rest of the bill needs to go out the window. You're going to ask something. I'm just going to say that the Obamacare has nothing to do with health care, in my opinion. It's control, and strictly control. And the reason that you said something about they're having a, uh, you know, where they don't have enough... Uh, I forgot in the beginning what the words you said. Where they, they, they couldn't <laughs> provide a certain amount of care. Well, that's how it's geared. Because eventually, the normal healthcare system is going to collapse. And as you said, the socialized medicine comes in. But it's all controlled, and it's up to us. Because most people here, the hair is this color. Well, there is no hair. And we're preaching to the choir, which is all good and well, but we have to let out children. Our grandchildren, though, they have to be educated and quickly. Yes. Because 2014 you know is make it or break it time. You're absolutely right. And that's why it's good this is going to be on YouTube. Because, Harry, right, have a sit down and watch the YouTube video. Um, hey, look, Grandpa was talking. <laughs> no, and then that's kind of the idea. Is that, hey, you know what, if you can wake up enough people say, what, what the heck is going on? I mean, a lot of the younger people have never seen the movie Soil and Green. Man. A lot of the younger people have never seen Logan's Run. I mean, a lot, I mean, there's science fiction movies to some extent, but you can see that a lot of people haven't read Atlas Shrugged, yeah. or a lot of people haven't read uh, Brave New World. But the more that you read, the more that you watch, you just watch the movies. All right, watch How about movie. just reading yeah, this, huh? Way, but here, watch. The more you start to, or actually a little more commonplace, the more you watch, if you want to watch a uh, uh, 1980s movie, it was uh, The Running Man with Arnold, right? That movie was a similar concept. You had an over-controlling, main bureaucratic uh, government, and then you had a game show to, or well, the cakes and circuses of ancient Rome, to keep people entertained, right. while people were actually having food riots and killing each other on the streets for it. Just read okay. this. Yeah. Logan Klein. Yeah, Logan. Good one. Yeah. Go to a doctor. We want to support a doctor yeah. who doesn't accept Medicare. Bring a chicken. Well, pretty much that's the way it's supposed to work, yes. Uh, because you have to uh, have the money to pay up front. I mean, they can work any deal out with you they want. They could say your bill, they could say, you know what, pay me when I come, when the check comes in. Oh, pay me half now, half later. You know, pay me, keep paying me $20 a month. Uh, until the money comes in. You know, like, there's lots of different ways because no longer do they have to abide by 
the government regulations for Medicare. So why, why should we have it then? Why should we have it? Excellent point. But it was about control. Um, well, what happens is a lot of the government plans kick you off that way. Yes. So, do you have to? Well, yeah, because they're going to kick you off. And you pay into the system that exists right now. In an ideal world, if I was temporarily emperor of the universe, that would be a really scary world. But if I was temporarily emperor of the universe, I could fix things with a snap of the fingers if I was a genie from Aladdin, if you will. Um, I would say, all right, you know what? Uh, with a snap of the fingers, Medicare system goes away overnight, and in place of it, everyone has this health savings account that are all prorated, and blah, 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 blah. And there you go. Um, I'm not a genie or an emperor of the universe. But... <laughs> <laughs> He's got principles. He can't run politics. One more question, and then during the half hour, if you want to talk to the doctor separately, I think with the mic, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a word in page 107 of the healthcare. It's called the minitude. I don't know if I it. The minitude? The minitude. Yeah. The minitude. Yes. Yep. The minitude. Can you explain that? I could. All right. <laughs> the minitude, if I, if I have my uh, uh, wording for exactly Arabic, and the minitude is the. Uh, the bribe, I think, that you have to pay uh, Muslims if you are non-Muslim, I believe that's yeah. the right term for that one, for divitude, is you have to, that they believe in the in Islamic religion, Total domination. is that if they have Sharia law, that everyone must be, if they, the radical Islamists especially, if they get what they want, the entire world would be, would either convert to Islam, uh, be subject to divitude, meaning paying that, they would have to practice Sharia law on the outside, so women would have to wear burqas, you couldn't wear the crosses, you couldn't wear any religious symbols, um, and you'd have to pay an extra tax for being a non-Muslim. And, um, yeah, that's, that's what difficult is. And of course, for the radical Islamists, the third option is, isn't the people who believe in the Hadith, which is the accessory book of the Quran, uh, which is slightly different, but um, basically, uh, it's dimitude, convert to Islam, or death. Those are the three options. The religion of peace, huh? No, he's saying it's in the healthcare law. I don't remember dimitude being listed, but if it is, uh, so that's the definition of dimitude. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, I mean, I've read the whole thing, but it's, it took me about eight months and it's 2,700 pages. So, I don't remember the reference to dimitude, but yeah, okay. It might probably relate to the Islamic exemption and you know, how they believe in dimitude as opposed to this. They probably just stuck it in there. And I'll have to look that one back up because I find it interesting. And now the hadith, just as a quick aside, because I know we have to pack up and go, which is the hadith is the accessory book not every Muslim believes in. It's kind of like uh, the apocryphal for us. Uh, we don't necessarily believe it or find it, but maybe it's reference, or maybe it's not, um, depending upon your denomination, whatever. But uh, the, uh, the hadith believes that this type of stuff will occur. And it talks about the Dijal and the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is the savior, the, the Dijal. And when the savior comes about, the will be the Dijal who will be the deceiver. And Jesus will come back as well. But Jesus will work with the Mahdi. And then what will happen is a select group of Christians will then side with the devout Islamists. And the rest will be either killed or subject to divitude. And uh, the other ones will convert to Islam. And then at that point in time, they will, they'll also kill all the Jews. And then from there, then Allah will return. And uh, people that believe in the Hadith believe that they can also, or the ra radical Muslims, believe that they can accelerate the return of Allah by accelerating the end of the world. Yeah. And, and we know, didn't judge. So can't the end of wait the world. till he gets yeah, so. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.